You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. Get cash for clothes at Plato's Closet in North Charleston and West Ashley. It's so easy. Recycle, earn cash, repeat. We pay cash on the spot for your trendy, gently used clothing, shoes, and accessories. At Plato's Closet, we buy all seasons, all day, every day. It's time to clean out your closet and cash in. Bring in your denim, graphic tees, athletic wear, shoes, handbags, and more. Sell your styles to Plato's Closet for cash. Then do it again. Plato's Closet, located in West Ashley on Sam Rittenberg Boulevard and North Charleston on Rivers Avenue. Hello, everyone, and welcome to History of the Second World War, Episode 149, The Winter War Part 7, The Isthmus Grind. This week, a big thank you goes out to Monica and Simon for choosing to become podcast members. You can find out more over at historyofthesecondworldwar.com slash members. Over the last few episodes, the podcast has looked at the fighting that was occurring north of Lake Ladoga, but south of the lake, on the Karelian Isthmus, the fighting would begin to rapidly escalate in intensity in late January 1940. The failures of the Soviet attacks in the north just reinforced the fact that the decisive theater of the war would be on the Isthmus, and the focus of both armies would be clearly on the Finnish defenses on the Isthmus during the early months of 1940. During these renewed attacks, the Red Army would have a new commander and a new plan. As the war drug on, the Finns were also running out of men and resources, and so the assistance of other nations was even more necessary, with the easiest possible avenue for that support being its Nordic neighbor, Sweden. Of all of the nations that could have sent meaningful aid to Finland during the war, Sweden was the best positioned to do so. With a long shared border and generally aligned political goals, the two Nordic countries were a match to work together. Swedish leaders also liked the idea of Finland continuing to exist as a buffer state between Sweden and the Soviet Union. There was real concern that if Finland was incorporated into the Soviet Union, an invasion of Sweden would soon follow. And it was this possibility that shaped Swedish military planning and preparations during the interwar years. During the 1920s and 30s, the most likely threat seemed to be either a Soviet invasion or an invasion by a Western power, and so the plan was to mass most of Sweden's defensive capabilities in southern Sweden to prevent amphibious landings along the coastline. Then, when the Winter War started, Sweden found itself in an an amazingly awkward and dangerous position. The basis for Swedish foreign policy remained complete and total neutrality. They advocated for a peace agreement to end their Winter War, but from a national political perspective, they made it clear that Sweden remained neutral. But there were many threats to that neutrality, even outside of the Soviet Union. After the war started, France and Britain had lengthy discussions and formulated plans about intervening on behalf of Finland, even if it meant war with the Soviet Union. But the best way to intervene would be to send troops and supplies through Norway and Sweden, but both of those nations were neutral. And if that did happen, and Sweden did not resist this transit of troops, it was very likely that Germany would invade Sweden to protect it as a source for iron ore. Even the idea of Britain and France moving troops through Sweden might have been enough to trigger a German invasion. And not to jump too far ahead, but this was a very reasonable concern for Swedish leaders because that scenario I just described, a threat of France and Britain uh, violating a nation's neutrality and then Germany invading just out of concern for the possibility is exactly why Germany would invade Norway. So, it is very real. All of these threats made it essential that Sweden maintain an official neutrality. But there were many instances of support for Finland among Swedish individuals and groups within society. This would result in the creation of the Swedish Volunteer Corps, which would fight in Finland during the war. The Volunteer Corps would eventually number about 8,260 men, although there were more applicants that were rejected. It's also worth mentioning here that there were volunteers from other nations inside the Corps as well. There were about 700 Norwegians, 600 from Denmark, but for nations that were further away, often the volunteers did not have time to reach Finland before the war started. So for example, about a thousand citizens of the United Kingdom volunteered and were actually on their way to Finland when the war ended. But the Swedes would always be by far the largest contingent, and their three battalions would be given a sector of front in northern Finland to defend. 
This allowed the Finnish troops that were previously responsible for that sector to be moved south for heavier fighting. As with any volunteer military group, the men who volunteered came from a variety of different backgrounds and joined for a variety of different reasons. Many were just seeking adventure, with one volunteer claiming that it was a ch the childhood memories of the First World War and the adventure of the military life that caused him to join up. Others believed that they were protecting Sweden by fighting the spread of communism into Finland. In January 1940, the Soviet government would launch an official complaint to the Swedish government about the Volunteer Corps, but this did not cause any change within the government on its views about the Corps. The Swedish response would be that the government had not participated in organizing a unit or recruiting its volunteers, and so it did not represent any violation of Swedish neutrality. In the end, the Swedish Volunteer Corps did not change the course of the war, but it would be a strong display of Nordic unity at a time when all four nations were under threat in their own ways. We first covered some of the actions on the Karelian Isthmus back in episode 3 of this series, before the narrative shifted to various fighting in northern Finland. But to refresh your memory, the opening attacks of the war on the Isthmus had largely been failures for the Soviets. They had been able to push the Finnish defenders back into the Mannerheim line, but once the fighting reached the primary line of defenses, it became very difficult for the Red Army troops to make meaningful headway against the Finns. The success of the defense led some Finnish leaders to start suggesting a counterattack on the Isthmus as early as December 11th, before the fighting even reached the primary line of resistance. Mannerheim believed these early proposals were premature and would not approve a counterattack until December 22nd, after the Soviet attack had started to bog down. The attack would take advantage of the fact that there was one Finnish division that had not yet been committed to the fighting, the 6th Division. The 6th Division would be one of the primary participants in the attack. The general plan for the attack was a bold one, a double pincer attack that would attempt to isolate and destroy many of the Soviet troops facing Suma on the southern end of the Isthmus. The 6th Division would attack along the southern pincer, while the 1st Division would attack along the northern pincer. If everything went well, three Soviet divisions would be cut off, and at the very least, it would completely destroy whatever the Soviet timetable was for another major offensive effort. But there was a problem. The Finnish goals were completely disconnected from their abilities on this sector of the front. In the north, Finnish attacks had been successful because they had taken advantage of Finnish strengths while preying on Soviet weaknesses, primarily around the much greater Finnish mobility and the spread out nature of the Soviet defenders. This would not be the case on the Isthmus, where the sheer volume of troops on both sides made mobility and surprise impossible. You're looking at like almost western front levels of the First World War, levels of troop density here. It's really hard to outflank uh, troops in that scenario. Finnish intelligence also just was not good enough for the operation. They did not really know what was beyond the very first set of Soviet units, with no real ability to know what the Red Army had in reserve or where those reserves were positioned. There would also be a couple of smaller mistakes made. For example, the 6th Division, when it was sent forward to prepare for the attack, would move forward too late and all at once, which created essentially a traffic jam behind the Finnish front, which meant that the attack would move forward with only a fraction of its expected forces at 6.30 a.m. Unfortunately for the Finnish troops, what they ran into when they did go forward was a solid wall of Soviet firepower. The large artillery advantage that the Soviets possessed in this area of the front made the attack basically over barely after it started, only a few hours later, and it had only advanced around two kilometers. It did not help that some of the 6th Division's units ran directly into a very large Soviet tank park, which they of course were unable to really attack or destroy. For the other pincer in the north, the attacks lasted a little bit longer, they were marginally more successful, but even there they ended by 3 p.m. They had advanced slightly further, but not really in the correct direction with the positioning of Soviet units and defenses forcing it to advance east and north instead of east and south, according to the plan, and this meant that the two Finnish pincers were never going to meet. Once the two Finnish attacks were stopped, it was almost impossible to restart the attack because Soviet reinforcements came streaming in from other areas of the isthmus and from the rear. Overall, the Finns would suffer about 1,300 casualties in the attack, with roughly the same number of Soviet casualties. But maybe more importantly, it made it clear to the Finnish leaders, that at least on the Isthmus, the decisive theater, it was impossible to recapture any kind of initiative, and they were largely at the mercy of the attacks of the Red Army, and their best hope was that the Red Army commanders continued to make the same mistakes they'd been making throughout the entire war. Get 
cash for clothes at Plato's Closet in North Charleston and West Ashley. It's so easy. Recycle, earn cash, repeat. We pay cash on the spot for your trendy, gently used clothing, shoes, and accessories. At Plato's Closet, we buy all seasons, all day, every day. It's time to clean out your closet and cash in. Bring in your denim, graphic tees, athletic wear, shoes, handbags, and more. Sell your styles to Plato's Closet for cash. Then, do it again. Plato's Closet, located in West Ashley on Sam Rittenberg Boulevard and North Charleston on Rivers Avenue. When the war started, Soviet planning had been for a quick march to Helsinki through the Isthmus, and the plan was for the war to be over in a matter of weeks. By the end of December, it was clear that this was going to be a much more challenging war than originally planned. It had already been going on for about a month now. And publicly, this was blamed on things outside of the control of the Soviet Union. The Mannerheim Line was stronger than the Maginot Line. Thousands of capitalist pilots and volunteers had arrived in Finland. The terrain was horrible. You know, that kind of stuff. But privately, most of the blame fell on the Soviet leaders in charge of the war, which were from the Leningrad Military District. A reorganization was in order, and it would take place in the first week of January 1940, when the Leningrad Military District was renamed to the Northwestern Front, and a new commander was brought in, Simeon Timoshenko. Like many other Red Army leaders who had survived the purchase, Timoshenko was a Civil War hero, having led a cavalry unit in the 1st Cavalry Army and forming a close personal bond with Stalin when they were both in Tsaritsyn, later renamed Stalingrad, during the Civil War. They were fighting the Whites at that time in southern Russia. Due to his connection to Stalin, Timoshenko was able to sideline all of the other party leaders that had been in control of the war up to this point in the conflict, and he brought with him a very bloody view of what would be required to win the war. This bloody view was something that Stalin agreed with and had signed off on. Timoshenko also brought with him a chief of staff, a man that we've already encountered on the podcast due to his victories in Mongolia, Georgi Zhukov. The combination of Timoshenko and Zhukov would bring a much-needed sort of better grasp of military planning and execution to the Red Army forces during the Winter War, and the reorganization would begin almost immediately. Many of the first changes were administrative. For example, on the Karelian Isthmus, the forces were divided into two corps so that they could focus on their own objectives. More troops were also brought onto the Isthmus, with several additional divisions brought into the line behind the troops that were already present. The Southern Corps was under the command of Meritskov, who would now have at his disposal nine infantry divisions, five tank brigades, a machine gun division, and enough artillery to have 80 guns per linear mile of front. These resources would now be used slightly differently than before, and they would begin what could best be described as a slow grind forward. Using their artillery and tanks, the forces would begin just shoving through the Mannerheim line, with the goal of simply overwhelming each individual's finished position, regardless of losses. Fresh troops and vehicles would just continue forward until the Finnish resistance collapsed. An important part of this were large shipments of tanks which were brought in, including new KV heavy tanks, which were much more powerful than anything that the Finns had seen up to that point in the war, including a large 76.2 millimeter gun. Tanks would also be used differently moving forward. Instead of charging ahead of their infantry and artillery, they would instead use their firepower to assist the infantry forward, with the infantry sticking with the tanks to provide them protection from Finnish anti-tank tactics that had seen so much success in earlier fighting. This was probably the most important change made during this time, with a firm emphasis on the importance of combined armed tactics and every arm of the army working together in unison to better utilize their individual strengths and cover for their weaknesses. In retrospect, this seems like a pretty simple subject, a pretty obvious change to make, but it was new to the Soviet forces in Finland, and it would make a tremendous amount of difference in the final stages of the war. When Timoshenko took over command, one thing that would rapidly become clear is that he was much better prepared to take advantage of the strengths of the Red Army, like we just talked about. And he wanted to focus more on artillery bombardment over the following days to soften up the Finns for an attack. Then for 10 days, the artillery and air bombardment would be brought up in intensity with the goal of pushing through Finnish defenses by February 11th. For longtime listeners, this very long bombardment might feel familiar. It was very reminiscent of the week-long bombardments of the First World War. The attack that followed those bombardments would largely be failures, but the Red Army in Finland in early 1940 had one key advantage. 
The Finnish forces were largely already committed to the front. There were no large concentrations of reserves, which were always present on the Western Front from 1914 to 1917. And Finnish forces were also not accustomed to this much artillery, and every day after February 1st would see the intensity of Soviet artillery fire and air attack increase, with nothing that the Finns could do. They were basically completely unable to respond. The strong Finnish bunkers were not necessarily damaged themselves, but everything around them would be destroyed. Trenches, telephone cables, smaller defenses, all gone. Any movements of troops between the various positions, impossible. During these days, every day, attacks would be launched, only after massive bombardments and always with almost overwhelming force. In some cases, there would be a hundred tanks or more leading these attacks, and they would act kind of as a steamroller, pushing forward with attacks multiple times per day, regardless of the casualties sustained. Finally, the Soviets were taking advantage of their massive numerical superiority by constantly feeding fresh troops into the attack, even though multiple attacks were occurring every day. The Finns were simply overwhelmed, mentally, by day after day of constant artillery fire, physically, by the inability to sleep through all of the explosions in the fighting, and then just numerically, by all the Red Army forces. There were many Soviet casualties during those days, but Timoshenko had been planning for that. He knew that to push through Finnish defenses would require a certain price in blood, and he was determined that if that price was to be paid, the attacks would, eventually, be successful. Mannerheim had a single reserve division, the 5th, at his disposal, but he faced the problem that would so often be faced by outnumbered defenders, where to use his division. He could split it up into smaller groups and send them forward to reinforce some of the sectors under attack, but by doing so, he would lose his ability to react to a Soviet breakthrough. But if he did not commit it early enough, he risked the Soviets achieving a breakthrough that could have been stopped. The problem was that the Soviets were attacking along the entire front, from Taipali in the north all the way to the Gulf of Finland in the south. In each sector, the fighting was different. In the center and south, the Soviets were attacking directly into the strongest positions of the Mannerheim line, and somehow the troops were continuing to hold. In the north, there was savage fighting around the coastal batteries on the shores of Lake Ladoga, with large Soviet units actually using the frozen lake to expand their attack frontage. But while the details differed, the general story was all the same. Unless something changed, whether through Finnish action, Soviet mistakes, or some kind of external factor, by February 12th, it was starting to look like it was only a matter of time before the Finnish defenders were simply ground down to nothing. The events of January and, and early February 1940 just drove home the fact that in a fight with the Soviet Union, if Finland was by itself, it had little chance of winning. There was always hope that help would arrive from other nations once the war started, but unfortunately there was another war going on by the time of the Soviet invasion, you, you may have heard of it, the Second World War. But this did not prevent France and Britain from at least considering sending troops to Finland. There were three major obstacles that stood in the way of this help arriving geography, the simple lack of resources, and the chance of war with the Soviet Union. The first problem is the easiest to discuss. When trying to extend meaningful military aid to Finland, geography was a problem, especially while the two nations were at war with Germany. The Baltic could not be used because Germany controlled it, and this meant that any military aid that needed to be sent to Finland had to go through northern Finland, but the ports in northern Finland would be overwhelmed by the requirements that would be placed upon them if there was a large British and French military effort into the region. The size of the largest plans involves somewhere around 100,000 British and 50,000 French troops, a considerable aviation resources as well, so all of this would be sent to Finland, and that would require a constant flow of supplies. The other option was to send the forces through Norway and Sweden, starting at the Norwegian port of Narvik, but both nations, Norway and Sweden, were neutral, and so moving troops through the two nations would have represented a violation of that neutrality, which both Norway and Sweden were not big fans of. And the British and French knew that they would not just allow it to happen without protests. Both nations were concerned about the possibility of a German invasion if their neutrality was violated and they did not resist. The, the British and French planned to give them kind of a, a, an out on a technicality, saying that they would label the forces sent to Finland as volunteers, but this was so flimsy. The second major obstacle was the fact that this type of operation would result in the Soviet Union joining in the war against Britain and France. In hindsight, even discussing bringing the Soviet Union into a war against, or against Britain and France on the side of Germany 
seems like complete and total madness. <laughs> but at the time, it was seriously discussed, both around helping Finland as well as bombing Soviet oil fields around Baku to stop the export of oil to Germany, a plan that, do not worry, we will discuss in much greater detail in a later episode. For this episode, the most important thing to say is that the idea of going to war with the Soviet Union was not a consideration that prevented detailed British and French planning for how they could send help to Finland and how that help could be sent. The final major obstacle, though, was simply gathering up the required forces that would have to be sent. Both Britain and France were ramping up their military productions with the goal of, of defending against the expected German attack into France, and so it was hard to bring together enough resources to send to Finland's aid. This did not hamper the desire for the fighting to shift into Northern Europe, though, and the French were always open to any idea, any possible idea, that might cause the fighting to not happen on French soil. So even with these obstacles, detailed discussions and plannings did occur in the Supreme War Council in early January, with both a large and small plan discussed. In the larger plan, the British and French governments would openly declare their intention to send military assistance to Finland, with the League of Nations as kind of their, their backing, and they would demand Norway and Sweden let them through, again due to the League of Nations. The Norwegian port of Narvik would be used, along with the Swedish port of Lulia, which, wouldn't you just know it, were the two primary ports used to export Swedish iron ore to Germany. That is such a coincidence. I wonder how that happened. This large plan was never going to happen, and instead the small plan was more likely, but this smaller plan would see the number of troops ramped up, as it was felt that the original 30,000 men were not enough to make the difference required, and eventually it would increase to that 150,000 number. Where were these men going to come from? Nobody really knew. And regardless, it required that Norway and Sweden let them transit their countries, which they were never going to do. And to add some additional sort of fillings to this impossible sandwich, the Finnish government was not even brought into these discussions until February, after many decisions had already been made. By that point, the Finnish government was already discussing how to end the war with the Soviets through negotiations. There were active negotiations happening, even at the cost of territory, like they were willing to give up territory by this point. And while they saw the British and French plan as a possible bargaining chip in those negotiations, their priority was still to get into direct negotiations with the Soviet Union and find some way, any way, to get out of the war. Fortunately for the British and French, and their later fates in the Second World War, they would not be able to send aid to Finland before those negotiations started and before they became public knowledge, which prevented them from making the unbelievable blunder of entering into a war with the Soviet Union, and possibly causing Germany and the Soviet Union to work closely together militarily against the Western nations for any period of time, which would have been an absolute disaster. So with foreign aid no longer a real possibility, I hope you will join me next episode for our last episode on the Winter War as we talk about the negotiations that would occur in Moscow and the final fighting on the Isthmus. <laughs>